The late 1950s and 60s would turn out to be one of the defining periods in modern African history, as all across the continent, the successful push for national independence by Pan-African pioneers like Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana, Julius Nyerere of Tanzania, and Nigeria's Namdi Azikiwe would mark the end of the colonial era in Africa. All across the continent, new national flags, emblems, anthems and currencies were unveiled and the leaders that had fought bravely to win independence for their countries were hailed as national heroes to be celebrated and revered for generations to come. Universities and airports were named after them. Their faces were printed on national currencies and statues were built in their honor. No longer shackled by the dictates of their former oppressors, Africa's new leaders were now free, in theory at least, to build their nations as they thought best. For many of them, the first step in the continent's post-colonial renaissance would be a complete rejection of all vestiges of colonialism. And according to the likes of Nkrumah, Leopold Senghor and Modibo Keita, capitalism and free market economics was one of the primary mechanisms of colonial exploitation that needed to be completely eradicated from African society. Marxist socialism, a philosophy which placed the responsibility for the economic well-being of the people on the shoulders of the government as opposed to private individuals and businesses was held by many of Africa's leaders as the best way forward for Africa and it would go on to be officially adopted in some form or other by nearly all of Africa's newly independent states. According to Kwame Nkrumah, socialist transformation was the only way to completely eradicate the colonial structure of Ghana's economy. For Julius Nyerere of Tanzania, his new nation will be guided by the principle of Ujuma, which was in essence a combination of the Marxist socialist ideas he was introduced to while studying at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland and traditional African beliefs on the importance of family and community. Leopold Senghor of Senegal would also infuse similar ideas into a philosophy that he and his contemporaries termed negritude. Kenneth Kaunda of Zambia, Marian Nguabi of Congo, and even Mobutu Sesasenko of the DRC also espoused some variation of the same principles. Tanzania's first constitution boldly proclaimed that the Tanzanian government would work to prevent the accumulation of wealth which it saw as inconsistent with the existence of a classless society. Under Nkrumah, the Ghanaian government pledged to work towards a complete ownership of the economy by the state. And to achieve this goal, all kinds of laws were introduced to enable government control over every aspect of the economy, from agriculture to banking, mining, wages, food prices, house rents, and even mass media. Within just 13 years after independence, nearly 6,000 prices for over 700 different product groups were controlled directly or indirectly by the Ghanaian government. Many private businesses were also acquired by the government and a host of government-run enterprises were established in their place. Over in Tanzania, the Arusha Declaration of 1967 officially established Tanzania as a socialist state and in the following years, several banks, insurance companies and foreign-owned businesses were taken over by the Tanzanian government. The government also rolled out its Operation Vijiji Villagization Program, which was aimed at the collectivized production and distribution of farm crops by the government. Starting in 1973, the Tanzanian government ordered the compulsory relocation of over 13 million peasants into about 8,000 cooperative villages, and by the end of the 1970s, around 91% of the entire rural population had been moved into government-run farming villages, where they would begin producing crops to be sold at government-mandated prices. Over in Guinea, President Sekou Toure's Marxism in African clothes philosophy would lead to the banning of all commercial activities not approved by the government, and police roadblocks were set up all around the country to monitor all internal trade. The Guinean state held a complete monopoly on all foreign trade and smuggling became punishable by death, and black market currency trading was punishable by 15 to 20 years in prison. The regime also nationalized a large number of privately owned farms and food prices were fixed at artificially low levels by government decree. Even in the relatively few self-proclaiming capitalist African countries like the Ivory Coast, Kenya and Nigeria, the drive towards government ownership and collectivization was embraced with open arms. Under the military leadership of General Yakubu Gowon, the Nigerian government declared in 1970 that a truly independent nation could not allow its objectives to be distorted by the manipulation of powerful foreign investors and so it was vital for the government to acquire and control on behalf of the Nigerian society the greater proportion of the productive assets of the country. Putting words into action, the Nigerian government would go on to acquire approximately 40% of all major banks, 55% of the petroleum industry, 40% of the insurance market and 100% of the telecommunications sector by the end of the 1970s. 
Unfortunately, despite the many glowing promises of a bright new dawn and prosperity for all, virtually all of these schemes had little to no success across the board, as policies supposedly aimed at creating abundance and reducing inequality ended up creating food shortages, black markets and untold pain and suffering to millions, as various government-owned enterprises failed to reach their targets, and the concentration of power in large bureaucracies resulted in eye-watering levels of corruption and abuses of power. Ghana's government-run enterprises were so inefficient that even by as early as the 1966 military overthrow of the Nkrumah regime, only 4 out of 64 state enterprises were financially self-sustaining. Over in Nigeria, government-run enterprises became nothing more than money-making machines for corrupt officials. In 1975, the Nigerian government commissioned a steel-making furnace known as the Ajaokuta Steel Mill. Either by willful ignorance or by administrative incompetence, the steel mill ended up being built on a site that was too far from the region's iron and coal deposits, rendering it basically useless. Over the course of four decades, Russian, German and French technicians would be paid billions to make the mill operational with little or no success. By the year 2017, the steel mill, which was reported to have reached 98% completion as far back as 1994, had still not produced a single unit of steel, even though the federal government had spent over $10 billion on it over the course of 34 years, and claimed it would require another $2 billion to complete the remaining 2% of the project. By 2019, the mill had attracted $8 billion in additional government subsidies, and still without producing a single beam of steel, over 100,000 workers were reported to be listed on its payroll. The Republic of Guinea, which as of independence was considered to have the biggest potential in all of Francophone Africa, thanks to its possession of one quarter of the world's reserves of bauxite and its abundant deposits of gold and diamonds, would go from being a net exporter of food to Africa and Europe prior to independence to spending one third of its foreign exchange earnings on food imports by the time of Sekou Toure's death in 1984. By 1981, a food crisis had gripped Tanzania, turning it from a net exporter into a net importer of basic foodstuffs as the government had to import 1 million tons of additional grain to fight starvation. In the eight years spanning 1974 to 1982, Tanzania's per capita income stagnated at $210 as the production of basic food crops such as maize, rice and wheat dropped by almost 50%. The level of devastation in Zimbabwe was almost unparalleled. As of gaining independence in 1980, President Robert Mugabe openly stated his intention to make Zimbabwe into a one-party nation, ruled by his ZANU party, which he described as a truly Marxist-Leninist party. Inheriting an economy that was ravaged by glaring racial inequalities under the former white minority regime, Mugabe's Marxist philosophy led to the implementation of all sorts of government controls on the economy, the establishment of government-run enterprises, and the forcible seizure of white-owned commercial farmlands without compensation. The result was a progressive decline in the Zimbabwean economy. Corn production dropped sharply from 2 million tons in 1981 to 620,000 in 1983. Food shortages became rampant and the cost of living rose astronomically. By 2008, the country was effectively bankrupt as the inflation rate reached a gobsmacking 2 million percent and the unemployment rate reached 80 percent. By the very next year, the nation's currency had collapsed and the US dollar was adopted in exchange for the Zimbabwean dollar. During the entire course of the Mugabe regime, an estimated 4 million Zimbabweans are believed to have fled to neighboring countries in search of greener pastures. But how did it all go so wrong? How could policies with the stated purpose of improving lives result in the direct opposite? For many commentators, the failure of these policies were not caused by the policies themselves, but due to a combination of foreign interference by the US and other world powers, as well as the moral failings and incompetence of the various government officials responsible for their execution. However, for a select few intellectual dissidents, such as Ghanaian economist George Ayite, it was the policies themselves that were to blame. According to Ayite, the good intentions of visionaries like Nkrumah and Inyerere were undoubtedly bound to be overruled by the greed and power loss of the individuals tasked with executing their grand visions. With the rollout of various government controls on the economy, the ruling elites discovered that they could use their powers to enrich themselves and also punish their political rivals. For example, by charging bribes for the granting of commercial licenses and by shutting down media houses that were critical of them. For Ayite, 
It was also no surprise that the various government-owned enterprises were inefficient and badly run, as they simply had no incentives to deliver in the same way as the private enterprises that preceded them. There was no need to innovate or pursue excellence, as most of them operated as monopolies, with no domestic or foreign competition. While the CEO of a private telephone service would be under pressure to maintain customer satisfaction by making the products as cheap and reliable as possible, a minister in charge of one of Africa's state-owned telephone companies was under no such pressures. To keep his job, he simply had to ensure that he maintained good relations with his friends in government. According to Ayite, Marxist socialist ideology has left behind two malignant legacies that might hold Africa back for some time to come. The first is a dependency mentality, which he describes as a tendency towards looking to the government and messianic leaders as the solution to every problem. Rather than placing the emphasis on the ability of Africans to help themselves through their individual ingenuity, inventiveness and hard work, Ayite alleges that many of Africa's founding fathers preferred to build cult-like followings by presenting themselves and their policies as the ultimate solution to all of Africa's woes. And even till today, new messianic figures continue to spring up, touting themselves as the ultimate saviors capable of saving their people from all pain and poverty. The second legacy of Marxist socialism, according to Ayite, is that the huge state bureaucracies and institutions that were set up in the 1960s to give effect to various socialist policies have not been dismantled, despite the fact that very few African countries still claim to be socialist states. The size and cost of the African public sector continues to grow year on year with the establishment of all kinds of ministries and commissions, very often with overlapping functions. As of 2009 in Ghana, for example, Rather than simply having a single Ministry of Transportation, the government was composed of a Ministry of Aviation, a Ministry of Roads and Highways, a Ministry of Transport, a Ministry of Roads and Transport, and a Ministry of Ports and Railways. In the very same year, Kenya was recorded as having 94 ministers and deputy ministers. Zimbabwe, despite its crippled economy, had 82 ministers, while Angola had 88. As of 2017, Ghana was recorded as having a record-breaking 110 ministers, and as of today, under the Akufo Addo administration, Ghana now boasts of a total of 123 ministers. Rather than looking towards reducing the cost and size of government, the trend all across Africa seems to be towards the creation of more and more commissions, ministries and government agencies, despite the very questionable track records of success of the existing ones. Ultimately, Mr. Ayite is but one man with one opinion. We want to know what yours is. What's your take on the legacy of Marxist socialism in Africa? As ever, share your thoughts in the comment section and let's get the debate going. Once again, it's KB Taiwo for New Africa. Please like, share and subscribe. And until next time.